your siblings, your classmates, your uh, office mates, the people you work with. Start influencing them. And by the way, when I talk about influence, I'm talking about positive influence, okay? I'm not talking about BI, huh? bad influence. Not that kind of influence. I'm talking about bringing about positive change in, in the lives of people. And we start out with, it's, it's, a, it's a decision that you and I make. Anyone, you know, in the beginning it might be a little, um, how do you call this? It might be a little, uh, uh, it, it might feel a little out of place or it might require a little more effort than normal. But I made a decision back in about 1987, I think, 1988, <coughs> that I will be a blessing and a source of revival to anyone that comes my way as much as I can. Whether it be one person, one crowd, one congregation, it doesn't matter. But as much as possible, I want people to be blessed every time they see me. And so I ask God to give me opportunities. Don't go around preaching all over the place because that's such a turnoff. You know, it's, it's something that comes naturally after a while. It just comes naturally. You just want to be a blessing. So how do you do that? By making sure your words are positive. By making sure your words are gracious. The Bible says, let your words be full of grace and seasoned with salt that you may be able to answer everyone. See, it doesn't matter who they are, whatever their stature or position is in life. They might be higher than you, lower than you, or appear. But you know what? When your words are gracious, everyone can receive. Everyone. And when you're gracious, they are strengthened by you. You know how some people are, they, you just see them, you feel drained already, right? I mean, these are the people, when you see them, you want to go to the other side of the street. You don't want to talk, you don't, you don't enjoy talking to them, see? Because they just have this anointing to suck out your joy, suck your strength, suck, they're, they're such suckers, you know? I mean, it's everything. <laughs> Every time, by the time you're talking to them, you feel so drained. And that was just two minutes. You know, more than that, I mean, you're, you know. But see, it requires extra grace to be with people like that. Now, if you're married to someone like that, God's grace is on you. <laughs> okay, um, this, the, for too long, the church... The church, the body of Christ, has been focused on needs. I said that last, uh, last week. We have been focused on needs, getting needs met. You know, paying the bills, putting food on the table, roof over our head. You know, what shall we wear? What will, should, what will we drink? What will we eat? And stuff like that. I mean, the basic Matthew 6, 25 uh, uh, needs. And, and for so long, the church has been focused on that. But I believe God is also saying now, I want you to move and focus on your desires focus on your desires see the thing is when you focus on your desires is it, it's interesting because God already promised to meet your needs see he already promised that and my, but my God shall supply see not might shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus now the moment you are uh, let, let me show you a let me show you a verse. Okay, look at this. In Psalm 23, verse 1, it starts out by saying, The Lord is my shepherd. Everyone say, The Lord is my shepherd. See, a shepherd is the one who guides. A shepherd is the one who makes the decisions. A shepherd is the one with a vision. A shepherd is the one who leads, who goes ahead. And he shepherds sheep. The sheep have basically two callings in life. Number one is to follow the shepherd. And number two is to eat. That's all the sheep does. Follow and eat. And then follow some more and eat some more. See? That's all they do. The, the, the sheep does not have to think, where am I going to find my next meal? That's the shepherd's job. The shepherd will be the one to scout 
and look for, for verdant pastures, green pastures, where they have good, nutritious grass and whatever else sheep eat. See, it's not the sheep's job to plan, to strategize, to come up with a 10-year plan saying, these are the places I will go, so I will make sure that I always have enough food and enough drink. See, Sheeps do, sheep don't do that. All they do is follow the shepherd. That's all they do. And you know what? It's the shepherd's job to make sure that they are comfortable because of their wool. They get all kinds of uh, flies and ticks and, and what have you. It's the shepherd's job to anoint them with oil so that uh, none, of the, none of these bugs can get in and attach itself to the skin. That's why he anoints my head with oil. Verse 5. See, that's what he does. He anoint, literally, he, he, he anoints every sheep with oil. That's a tremendous amount of oil, especially if you have even just a hundred sheep. That's a lot of oil that the shepherd needs to seek out and purchase and just to care. And the Bible also says he knows you by name. A good shepherd always gives a name to his sheep. And the sheep know his voice. See, the Lord is my shepherd. It's not enough for me to know that the Lord is Pastor Yoli's shepherd. And I hope that if, if or, or maybe I'll, I'll pick someone else. Let's say the, the Lord is Grace's shepherd and because she's my wife, hopefully he'll also take care of me. See, it doesn't work that way. This is a personal shepherd. doesn't matter that you are married to someone who's born again. Uh, uh, and you're one flesh, the Lord is her shepherd, but the Lord must also be my shepherd. You understand what I'm saying? See, the Lord is my shepherd. Now, look at what happens. When the Lord is your shepherd, there, I, I got from three different versions. The first one, New King James, I shall not want. The New Living Translation, I have all that I need. The Amplified says, I shall not lack. See, when the Lord is your shepherd, your needs are met. See, it's, it, it, it's a package deal. When the Lord is your shepherd, your needs are met. The problem is, we have been praying for our needs, and nothing wrong with that, but the problem with that is that we have become so focused on our needs that we have not had time to focus on our desires. And the, here's the thing. When you're focused on your needs, your focus is inward. What will I eat? What will I drink? What will I wear? The focus is always inward. But the moment you start focusing on desires, you start looking outward. See, why? Because your needs are met. No one, if you understand Abraham Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs, you always start with, not that I advocate it, but there is some measure of wisdom in it. You always start with your basic needs. Before you think of, before you think of self-actualization, you know, and, and, and meditating on, on esoteric things and meditating on the things of God, you always think, what am I going to eat? But the moment that's met, you now can move to other things and focus on other things. See, and that's why God said, look, the Lord is my shepherd. Uh, David said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not. I shall not. I will not. I'm not going to lack anything. I'm not going to need anything. I'm not, what? The Lord is my shepherd. He takes care of all these things. See, we have, unfortunately... Uh, the Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, remember, so is he. Now, if you're so focused on your needs and thinking that your needs will be met only when you pray, then what happens is you are actually blocking the outpouring of the, of the supply for your needs. Why? Because you're saying, Lord, I need this. Lord, I need this. And he's saying, hey, I'm your shepherd. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. That's, that's what he's saying here. When you understand the relationship between shepherd and sheep, the sheep 
does not worry every time the shepherd is around. He absolutely